Welcome to Uprising, David Graeber. Thanks. So in your book, you tackle a very fundamental question um, at the outset um, before you go into the history of debt, and that is how we think about debt um, and, and how it becomes and has become a question of morals, of morality. And no matter what one's politics, we have so deeply ingrained into our minds the fact that if we are in debt, we are obliged to pay off that debt. Mm -hmm. How did that concept come to be so prevalent? Well, in a way, I wrote the book to answer that very question, because it's something to smack your head against all the time if you're doing political organizing, for example. The fact that anybody who's in debt feels that they have done something wrong. And you see that over and over again, actually, throughout world history. Even the words for debt, sin, and guilt are the same in so many languages, from Sanskrit to Aramaic to German. Um, so in a way, I guess what I was really trying to ask in the book is, first of all, how is it that we come to see all moral imperatives as if they were debts? Um, and why is it that that notion of debt has this moral hold over us? Uh, and I start the book with a conversation where I'm describing structural adjustment policies to this very well-meaning, you know, sort of liberal activist lawyer. Um, and, you know, describing things like the death of thousands of babies, you know, through um, these people who had to cut their um, medical services. And, you know, the reaction is, yeah, but surely you can't expect people to just cancel the debts. I mean, people have to pay their debts. They borrow the money. And so that, that commonsensical power. I mean, you can come up with 27 different reasons why this is absurd, but each one would take 10 minutes to explain, whereas that is just... You just, it's just five words, and it just seems self-evident. Hmm. And so in, in many ways, that um, language and that logic mm -hmm. is, um, is used to justify the forced repayment of debt. Well, the word force is critical here, because one thing I found, when I was trying to figure out what is debt, I mean, the basic definition of the concept is unclear. Uh, it's not any kind of moral obligation, uh, although people try to extend the notion in that way. Well, a debt is just one type of promise. It's a promise that, I like to say, is corrupted by math and violence. Um, it, it, it's something where you can be exact and exactly quantify what is owed. Therefore, it becomes impersonal. Therefore, it becomes transferable. So, you know, um, as I always like to say, if I promise to love you forever, you can't give that to someone else. Mm. If, I, if I promise to meet you at five, you can't give it to someone else. But a, a mathematical, impersonal debt, you can. And the way that's what money is, it's circulating debt. Mm. Uh, but that's only made possible by a relation of force. But the other side of that is that that language is the cleverest method anyone has come up with to take a, a relation of force and make it seem moral. Not only to make it seem moral, make it seem like the victims are to blame. Hmm. Well, let's, let's go into the history. First of all, the standard accepted history written by economists of how money came to oh, yeah. be. And, um, and, and you describe in your book how there's an accepted myth that first came bartering, mm -hmm. then came the invention of currency, then came credit, if you will. Mm -hmm. And you and other anthropologists have said that there's really no evidence for this? Zero. Um, this has been kind of a pet peeve of anthropologists for at least 100 years. Uh, Adam Smith made up this story, you know, in 1776, actually, when he wrote Wealth of Nations. Um, he was just speculating what must have happened to lead to money. And he said, well, I imagine that people would just swap things with each other. And um, I would say, you know, I need a cow. Tell you what, I'll give you 20 chickens for that cow. Okay, how about 30? And you negotiate, you know, come to a deal. And... Um, problem is that, you know, if they don't happen to need chickens, you don't have anything else they want, no deal. So you kind of have to invent something to use as a medium of exchange. This is the standard line. And everybody learns this in one way or another. Um, just the other day, I was, you know, chatting with the airport security guy as he was scanning me about my book. And I said, oh, it's about debt the first thousand years. And he was like, 5,000 years? I assume they would all be using barter back then. You know, everybody, everybody has this in their head. The problem is, you know, anthropologists have been going through the world pretty much everywhere for the last hundred years trying to find some place where they do that, and, and they just don't exist. It's, it, um, 
There is You're no saying that barter doesn't exist as, a, as, as adopted a in a society? Within societies. I mean, people will do barter with strangers. You know, if there's somebody you're never going to meet again, well, you kind of got to swap things. But oh, if it's people that are your neighbors, which is the original scenario, if it's people you're in any kind of regular contact with, um, or even really if it's regular trade, people don't do that. And, and if you think about it for a moment, it's kind of obvious why they wouldn't, because what the standard story assumes is that people will deal with their neighbors in what economists call the spot trade. You know, I give you something, you give me something, we walk away, and if we can't settle the deal right now, that's it. Well, that's silly because, you know, it, even imagining the sort of 20 chickens for the cow scenario and the guy doesn't need chickens, well, you know, I'm his neighbor. I'm going to have something he wants at some point, and it's nice to have neighbors in your debt. Uh, in fact, what you actually observe in most communities where people are, you know, people of relatively equal status who are neighbors uh, are coming to some sort of arrangement with each other about stuff. For example, it's often the case that if you just praise an object that belongs to someone else, they kind of have to give it to you. So what would really happen is you go up and you say, wow, that's a beautiful cow, you know, and there's really no appropriate response. There's nothing you can say other than, oh, well, I mean, it's not much, but take it, please, you know, you're my neighbor, I love you. Uh, don't even think about giving me something back. But of course, we all know now I owe him one. So what you get is a sort of credit and debt situation, but it's sort of, it's not a specific one where you can quantify exactly how many of one thing equals another. Usually you have a sort of rank of sorts of things, like how is roughly the same as a canoe, is the same as a jade necklace, is the same, um, second rank, third rank, fourth rank types of objects. Um, or you could, you know, it's not necessarily an object, too. It could be a favor. You need help with something. It's good to have people in your mm -hmm. debt. So what they're making up, you know, these economists, is a story which imagines that essentially social relations don't exist, that people are only thinking about the stuff, which is fine if you're inventing economics, which is the study of people who are only thinking about the stuff. But that's not how actual people normally behave. So is there evidence that societies, whole societies, behaved on on credit and lending and borrowing, uh, you know, items and keeping tabs, if you will, mm -hmm. before currency existed? Absolutely. There's, uh, um, that is what all evidence tends to indicate. Um, I, I should make a distinction here. I mean, the the scenario I was just alluding to is more a case of it's not nobody's tabulating anything. There's sort of a vague sense of, you know, I owe you sort of like that, I owe you sort of like this. Um, the question is how it becomes quantified. And oddly enough, all evidence we have indicates that it's legal systems where that starts to happen, when you have to pay fines, um, because that's the, t the situation where people are in no mood to compromise. Um, and, you know, would you somebody's eye gets poked out, it'll be like 27 heifers for an eye, or, you know, this means war. Uh, and if you don't have heifers, you actually do have to figure out how to substitute. So in situations like that, where there's a potential for violence, where people are in a very uncompromising situation, that's precisely when they start counting things and demanding exact equivalents. There's other ways that money crops up. Um, it seems that the first forms of money in Mesopotamia had to do with people who had to... Um, they had these very complex temple complexes with thousands of people working for them, often widows and orphans at first, and after war they start bringing in captives. Um, but they have to allocate materials within these bureaucratic complexes, which aren't actually states, they're, they're autonomous. Um, they run themselves, but you know, there's people doing fishing, there's people doing um, pastoralism, there's people growing things, there's people ma making things, they have these little factories, and they have to distribute stuff and uh, calculate rations and equivalents, so they, they make up a system where everything is equivalent to a certain amount of silver. And that markets kind of develop on the side of that, where people start using those systems. But the interesting thing about ancient Mesopotamia, for example, is that they don't seem to have been actually using the silver to buy stuff. Hmm. Um, in fact, sort of Real giveaway is they didn't make scales accurate enough to weigh the very very tiny bits of silver that would have been required to buy, you know, a hammer, a chair, a shirt, or something like that. Even though it seems that people were after a while buying them, so everything was put on the tab. Hmm. So gold and silver have at various points in human history been considered currency or equivalent to currency, mm -hmm. being able to measure something uh, in the mm -hmm. form of a metal that doesn't corrode. Um, how, how, how does that figure into the history of currency and money in the U.S.? 
in the U.S. Uh, I'm sorry, worldwide. <laughs> worldwide. Ah, okay. Um, well, I mean, at first, they mainly just kept the gold and silver stockpiled and used it as the basis of credit transactions. Egypt tended more toward the gold, Mesopotamia toward the silver. Um, I mean, they, you know, merchants, um, very rich people would occasionally actually show up with the stuff. Um, or sometimes you'd bring it in at the end of the year. So you'd run up a tab and uh, with your local merchant and then every six months to a year, you just sort of show up with something either denominated in silver, if you had some silver, actual silver. But again, they weren't stamping the silver in uniform bits. Um, you just have to weigh it out. Uh, so so that's what you have at first. The question is, what, why did people actually start using it in everyday transactions? And that happens quite late. You know, we're already seeing these credit transactions, interest rates um, discussed in documents of 3200 BC. Um, Coinage, on the other hand, actual systematic circulating bits of gold, silver, and bronze crop up, well, it seems maybe around 700 BC in the Eastern Mediterranean, but definitely by 600 BC in China and India as well. And it's not like the idea spreads. It seems to be independently invented in all three areas. They're using hmm. different technologies, for example, to make them. Um, but the social situation is remarkably similar in each case. What you find in, in the Ganges Valley, in the North Plains of China, in the Eastern Mediterranean, you start with a bunch of little kingdoms all at war with one another, often hiring mercenaries, and gradually they, you get some of them win, you get uh, empires based on standing armies. Of course, standing armies have to be paid. And it makes sense that coinage would be invented to pay soldiers, which seems to be what happened, because Usually there's like one or two generations where it's the state isn't quite involved yet, but it seems to be where the soldiers are that you get these things. And then quickly the government jumps in. Uh, and it makes sense if you think about it this way. Well, okay, here are these people operating on credit, most transactions on credit. Who is the last person in the world you're going to want to extend credit to? A heavily armed soldier who's just passing through. On the other hand, who is the person most likely to actually have little bits of gold and silver? the same guy who's just been looting and pillaging. Uh, so cash markets of some kind will, are most likely to crop up where armies are. And governments get involved because it becomes this very efficient way of provisioning armies. Uh, if you think about it, and it's actually one of the great mysteries of antiquity, is why did kings demand taxes in gold and silver coins? I mean, it might seem obvious they wanted the money, but in fact, they produced the money. Um, if gold and silver were just naturally became money because of trade, well, the logical thing to do would be grab the gold and silver mines. You have all the money. And in fact, kings would do that. The question then is, why do you take the gold and silver that you've just grabbed, stamp your picture on it, give it to people, and then say, okay, everybody in the kingdom has to give me one of these back again? Hmm. <laughs> in a way, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, but it makes perfect sense if you're trying to feed an army. Because, you know, here I have 50,000 guys, heavily armed, sitting on my border, uh, how do I feed them? They're going to eat everything edible, you know, within walking distance in, in a few weeks. Uh, after that, unless you're going to employ another 50,000 people, you know, bringing them food all the time, you're in trouble. I mean, either you've got to send them out conquering people all the time, which doesn't always work, or um, you've got a problem. Well, the easiest solution to the problem is give them little pieces of gold and silver with your name on it. Um, which, of course, is the kind of thing they'd be carrying around anyway. There are already these little markets on the side. And then say, everyone in the kingdom has to give me one of these back. You automatically employed your entire population getting soldiers things they want. Hmm. Let, let's talk about uh, the sort of um, religious... Um, a backdrop to uh, the concepts of debt and actually how religion itself views mm. and various religions have viewed debt because it's it's a pretty strong theme throughout most organized religions. Uh, the Catholic Church comes um, most strongly to mind um, and, and the concept of money lenders mm -hmm. as being sort of uniformly evil uh, viewed throughout, yeah. throughout so many different cultures. Uh, it, it sort of... Um, it runs counter to the power that moneylenders have in our society. On the one hand, they've been vilified for most of civilization. On the other hand, they have armies or can have armies mm -hmm. and can use the force of violence to extract debts. And, and in fact, if they don't have armies, they really can't. Mm -hmm. um, you, know, you can't really Their be power a comes from violence. Exactly. Um, yeah, one of the things that fascinated me as soon as I began looking into this stuff was 
that ambivalence. Um, you know, the fact that mor- people will always say morality is just paying your debts, but then they'll say money lenders are evil. Well, how do you square that? Um, and that conversation, which I started, where I'm talking to this person and uh, about canceling the debts, and she's like, well, surely you have to pay your debts, and then we, I sort of come up with all the reasons why that's not the case. Um, it's like, that, it's like that conversation has been happening for 5,000 years over and over and over again. And in fact, the great world religions, it's quite the same. Um, I like to talk, start with Plato's Republic, since a lot of people have, have read that. You know, It begins in the same way. They say, well, what is justice? And there's this rich guy, he's like this wealthy arms manufacturer, uh, manufacturer named Kephalos, and says, well, justice is just a matter of paying your debts and not lying. You know, Socrates blows that one away immediately. He says, well, say somebody lent me his sword, and then he goes violently insane and wants it back to kill somebody. Uh, obviously, I'm not going to give it to him, uh, and I'll probably make up some lie as to why not. Um, so he says, oh, whatever, I don't know, something else. Then. Um, <laughs> kind of drops it and wander, wanders off, and the rest of them end up saying, well, okay, it's not debt, what is it? And that question, you know, well, isn't morality just paying your debts? No, actually it isn't. Um, you get it in the Brahmanas, where they say, you know, life is a debt that you owe to the gods, and you owe a debt to your parents who you repay by becoming parents, and you owe a debt to the sages who created wisdom, which you repay by becoming a sage and becoming wise, um, a debt to humanity, which you pay by mm, being kind to strangers and hospitable. Um, you know, the moment you examine it, you know, you realize they're not talking about debt at all. You wipe out the debt by becoming the thing you owe. You owe, you owe to your parents, but then you become a parent. Um, in a way, it's the same, owing a debt to the cosmos, which is what the gods really are. Um, that doesn't make any sense. How That would imply that me and the gods or me and the cosmos are two equivalent parties to a business transaction. You know, it's absurd. So you only can get rid of the debt by realizing it isn't there because you are part of the cosmos. Um, there's no ultimate difference. Uh, in the Old Testament, they start the same way. Debt is um, basis of morality. In fact, even the, the Lord's Prayer in Aramaic actually reads, forgive us our debts, just as we forgive our, our, those who owe us money. But of course, the trick there is we, we don't normally forgive those who owe us money. So it's right. sort of implying, well, you know, you're a sinner, aren't you? Um, why should God forgive you? But he does, because what is sacred is not to pay debts, but to forgive debts in um, the Old Testament and New Testament. So over and over again, you start with debt as morality, except no, actually it isn't. So there's a lot of moral <laughs> confusion in exactly. religion around debt. Exactly. And the question is, well, why do they have to start with that if then they say it's not true? And the best conclusion I could come to is exactly that situation. Well, think about it. Most people who have ever lived have been told that they are debtors. How could that be the case? You know, who are they owing this to? I mean, did the 1% of the population who happened to be rich really do so, were, were so wonderful and give them so much stuff that, like, somehow all of those people were, were, were beholden to them? Clearly, what we're talking about is a way of justifying relations of force. And it makes sense because you know, mafiosi understand this. You want to shake somebody down, you relate it, make it a relation of debt, and then you're nice to them about it. And suddenly, they seem like they're the ones who should be ashamed of themselves. You know, you say, I conquered you. Therefore, you owe me your life, which I interpret literally. I expect payment for your life. But, but you know, I'm a nice guy. I'm going to let you off the hook for the first six months. And after that, terms are negotiable. But I do expect that money. Suddenly, you're the one who's running around, you know, feeling inadequate. Um, However, it tends to blow up in people's faces. Most revolts, insurrections in world history are also about debt. And if you're going to reply to this, the only, you know, and it makes you indignant, because I, I think that it's really the case that of all forms of inequality, you know, it does, when it explodes, it explodes biggest. Because if you say you're inferior, you're a serf, you're a slave, you're a low caste, whatever it might be, um, you know, nobody likes that very much. But if you say you should be my equal because you owe me something, but you have failed, you know, your life is a failure, you're an inadequate human being, it tends to make people even more angry. Um, so when it blows up, it blows up big. And what do people start saying? Uh, always the same thing. It's like, wait a minute, who owes what to who? I'm the guy who makes all the food around here. What have you ever done that I show you something? Uh, 
but voila, you're using the language of debt. Right. So suddenly political arguments are all about debt and are kind of trapped in this language, which is how people are arguing about Right, things. and there's so much relevance to our current political um, conversation, which I do want to get to, but let me remind our listeners I'm speaking with David Graeber about his book, Debt, The First 5,000 Years. Um, in, in looking at... Um, history then, uh, how does, how do these concepts of debt figure into, and the logic of the mafia figure mm-hmm. into colonization? Um, you bring up the history of Madagascar and mm-hmm. Haiti, mm-hmm. Um, which are two very um, stark examples, but uh, presumably throughout the history of colon- colonization, the country that has been colonized somehow ends up in debt to the colonizer. Isn't and that interesting? Just, yeah. you know, I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's true, mm-hmm. and we may take it for granted, but it says a lot, I think, about what debt really is used for. Absolutely. And it also alludes to the example I said of of, of feeding the army, because um, one of the myths that we have in our heads is that governments and markets are somehow inimical to one another. They're opposite principles. So that, you know, throughout the last 100, 200 years of political history, we've been told, we basically have to make a choice. We can go for the government bureaucracy or we can go for the market. Um, In fact, if you look at history, you discover that markets and governments are intimately tied to each other and can't really exist without each other to a large extent. Governments create markets, markets sustain governments. It's the same thing with the colonial world. The first thing they do is they use tax policy, just the way that the ancient kings used tax policies to create markets to feed soldiers. They create tax policies to create markets. So General Galliani, when he co- conquers Madagascar, one of the first things he says is essentially, well, you know, Outfitting an army to conquer you is expensive. Colonies were, are supposed to sustain themselves. I'm going to charge you now for the cost of your conquest. I will issue paper money, and everybody's got to give me, you know, 20 Malagasy francs back again every year. Uh, and it was, I mean, they were utterly self-conscious about what they were doing. They, uh, you know, they said, um, I think they called it the moralizing tax in French or the wow. educational tax. Yeah, it would teach them the value of work. You know? right. um, so the colonized yeah. is indebted to the colonizer mm-hmm. for being colonized. Exactly, yes, yeah. so the expenses of being conquered. And um, they did the same thing in India. It was extremely intentional, the idea of creating markets, because they were, this is ridiculous. You have all these self-sustaining communities. Uh, we need to have these people in debt so they will start doing wage labor so we can have exports. Uh, so debt was used very, very intentionally. And one of the things I discovered while writing the book that really surprised me is the slave trade actually ran entirely on debt. There was like endless chains of indebtedness. It all started with financiers in London who would um, then fund merchants in Bristol, who would advance products to merchants in Africa. um, And it would go down the chain so that they would lend things to lend things. And get people involved in debt traps, either to force them into raiding people to get slaves or often into selling members of their own family or they get people caught in these terrible debt traps, which is, of course, the great social nightmare throughout history is like the population falls into indebtedness so severe they have to sell off members of their family or even themselves into slavery. Hmm. Well, related to that is a very fascinating part of your book um, about marriage and debt. And, I mean, it's... Grim. It's a very grim history. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it makes one um, think very much about whether women were treated as currency. In some places they were. And this is one of the things that really startled me when I was looking at the history of medieval Ireland. They had this very complex system of honor price. Everyone has a price in honor, um, which is what you have to pay if you insult them. It's all legal systems again. Uh, but the highest denomination of currency are the kumals, which are slave girls. Hmm. And I, you know, So my first reaction, well, where does that come from? Uh, and nobody would say. I started looking around, and everybody just sort of, oh, yeah, then they're slave girls, um, as if this is just completely unremarkable. Um, and I the more I started looking into it, the more I realized that that, that slavery is essentially the most the primary form of commoditization. That's where it all comes from. Um, there is a large debate in the 1920s about what they called 
well, that they used to call Bride Price and they renamed Bride Wealth because the League of Nations has discovered in all these um, parts of Africa and other, other parts of the world that they said, oh, people are buying wives. This is a form of slavery. We should wipe this out. Is it the same as dowry? Uh, right. It's different. Dowry hmm. is pa- intergenerational. So basically it's premature inheritance. And it, normally it goes in the other direction. It goes from the bride's family to the groom's. Right. Um, whereas Bride Price goes from the um, groom's family to the bride's. And it goes, you know, across from the same generation. And this is what anthropologists rushed in to say. They said, well, this isn't buying a woman because you can't resell her, can you? You know, it's just an arrangement. Um, You know, you can't sell your wife. Oddly enough, there are one or two places in the world where you could sell your wife. It's extremely unusual. One of them was England. Wow. Um, Yes, and only 18, no, 1923 was the last case. It was um, technically legal for a man to auction off his wife if she'd been unfaithful. Um, But, um... This is sort of clouded things a little, but anyway, they they came in and they said, no, no, you're not buying anybody. Uh, it's 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 a ceremonial thing. It's and and this is true to a large degree. In a way, what you're doing when you make these payments in what I call human economies, where money is used to rearrange social relations, is you're saying nothing could possibly be the equivalent of your daughter, and I'm giving you this money to recognize that. Just as you'd give the same money if somebody is killed and say, well, you know, I I would never say that this is the same as your son, who you know my brother killed. Sorry about that. Um, But, you know, this is our way of recognizing that nothing could possibly recompense you. So in a way, it's a way of recognizing a debt that can never be paid. However, with slavery, suddenly it turns into a debt that can be paid. Um, And one of the fascinating things to watch is how these human economies, where you can't pay debts, but at least you're, you know, passing currency to say that you recognize that, turns into something where you can buy and sell people and you can buy and sell things. Uh, and a lot of it has to do with debt. You know, for example, in Mesopotamia, you know, you, you give, present money, uh, large amounts of silver for when you get married to the, your, the bride's family, and often the uh, bride's family give it to the bride and she'll actually wear it, you know, with these silver bands, which are the equivalent of how much her husband paid, you know, to show off how much she's worth. And, um, you know, it's not buying someone at all, except all of a sudden, if the guy takes out a loan, his wife is security. So right. when debt comes in, suddenly she is transferable. And you hear of this yeah. thing happening even today in mm-hmm. Afghanistan with, you know, poor farmers who can't, who are in debt to the opium warlords. They yeah. offer their daughters as payment. Precisely. And so we see this sort of thing happening. Now, let's go, let's go back to, we were talking earlier about bartering, credit, mm. uh, gold and silver as, as currency. How did the introduction of of money coinage, um, when it became sort of used in a mass scale, uh, maybe around the time when currency becomes international, how does that Mm -hmm. change society? And also, how does it change the concept of debt, if if it does at all? Once you have coinage, um, well, it creates a crisis. Um, Whenever you first get markets coming in, it actually... The stuff we were just talking about is a large part of it. It creates a – one of the first things you always see is a crisis over slavery and prostitution mm-hmm. um, because, you know, in the past, using currency was a way of saying that sexual relations are legitimate, you know. Um, this is a proper marriage. Money has changed hands. Uh, suddenly, you get phenomena like prostitution. You get slaves um, who are generally sexually available, and there you have to distinguish the good girls and the bad girls. Um, in fact, there's a feminist historian, Gerda Lerner, who had a book called The Invention of Patriarchy, where she talks about this, um, which I used quite extensively. She points out the first reference to veils um, that we have are in this Middle Assyrian law, where they're actually saying that, you know, respectable married women uh, have to wear veils. Prostitutes and slave girls cannot wear veils. And all the penalties are not on, you know, the respectable women who don't, but on the uh, not respectable women who do. So you have to distinguish, mm-hmm. like, what women are commoditizable and what aren't. So it becomes a gender crisis in a lot of cases. And um, you see the same thing happen in ancient Greece, incidentally, where Athenian women actually had to wear veils. Most people don't know that because it sort of flies in the face of all of our prejudices about, you know, who's free and who's not. And, uh, but, yeah, they did. Um, the so so what's one of the first things that happens and 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 one of the arguments I make is the biblical patriarchy this is tendency to sort of revile both the great money lenders and the great prost, you know places of prostitution comes from this sort of fear that ordinary Mesopotamian farmers had that 
you know, their daughters were going to be taken away to the temple to be turned out as, as prostitutes and uh, because of debts, and people would simply run away and join these desert nomad groups um, or semi-nomadic pastoralists who lived at the fringe of the city, lock up their children. Um, so it almost starts as a form of resistance against, you know, great concentrations of wealth and what was going on, and then it turns into a thing of its, uh, of its own. So, so you have these moral crises when, you know, what had been money being used to rearrange relationships between people turn into a market economy. Um, same sort of crises happen over and over again. Hmm. Now, uh, in, in looking at how these concepts work today, I want to ask you to discuss how debtors are treated differently depending upon what class uh, they come from. Yeah. So from, I guess, the history of civilization, rich debtors have historically mm -hmm. generally been treated very differently from poor debtors. Indeed. And you give some great examples, such as in England, and we see the same thing today. Absolutely. Bank I mean, of America versus a person who took a bad mortgage. Exactly, or AIG versus someone with a student loan, yes. It's, and um, one thing I discovered, I mean, that, that point about violence is critical. When you have debts between equals, they really are just a promise, and promises, of course, could be renegotiated when circumstances change. Uh, people are reasonable with people they consider to be people like themselves. So in the same way that if my brother is in trouble and I want to give him some money, I'll say, no, no, it's a loan. You know, it's a, don't want to embarrass him by giving him a gift. And, um, and then we forget or we remember it differently. You know, you could rearrange things. And the same is true of rich people, you know. Um, back to the earliest Mesopotamian documents, you'll see these things saying, well, of course, we're both gentlemen. You're not going to charge me interest on this, are you? Um, hmm. <laughs> Very early you see this going on, and, and the way I put it is rich people can be incredibly kind, generous, and understanding when dealing with other rich people. I even call it the communism of the rich mm -hmm. at one point. You know, of course it's from each according to their abilities to each according to their needs will work something out. And, and that's what we saw in 2008 where they made trillions of dollars worth of debt vanish through the waving of various complicated magic wands of one sort or another. Now, when it's a debt that you owe them, on the other hand, suddenly it's sacred. And Suddenly, it's a question it's, of morality. It's, yes, it's a question of very basic morality. You should be ashamed of yourself even suggesting. How could you say? It, it, it's, it's amazing. And this has been true constantly. I, I, I use the example of the debtor's prison because it became a scandal in the, in the 1600s in England that they actually had two wings to debtor's prisons. Um, and one wing was for the poor debtors, and they were not even fed because the idea is you're a deadbeat. Why should you live off the state? Um, so unless they could figure out some way to get their relatives to bring them food, they would die of starvation. They'd be like living in these like tiny, you know, insect-ridden pestilent cells, usually last about six months before they died. Uh, and the other branch was the rich debtors um, who were, you know, allowed to have their own caterers and receive regular visits from prostitutes and manicurists and so forth and so on, and often would, like, voluntarily submit themselves because it, it was nice to get away for a little while and, con you know, to go to the debtor's prison to have some, uh, where people wouldn't bother you so much. Um, you know, it's completely double standards. In fact, if the poor debtor survived at all, it's because they took jobs with the rich debtors in the next cell. Hmm. So today we have the situation um, with rich debtors versus poor debtors, um, but um, I want to go a little bit back, uh, say, 10 years ago or so when the anti-globalization movement mm -hmm. was in full swing and the conversation around third world debt was really big. And I know you're in, you've been involved in the mm -hmm. struggle against third world debt and, 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 and for forgiving of that debt uh, for a long time. Um, and... Uh, Again, and then this prompted the conversation that you cite in the earlier part of your book in the introduction where you talked to this lawyer and it was around third world debt. And I think it's a conversation that is worth um, bringing up here during this interview, which, um, which is, you know, earlier we discussed uh, colonization and how it has turned former colonies into debtors. And in effect, many of those debts um, are related to the debts the third world countries find themselves in today Indeed. because of the IMF. Mm -hmm. So how how do how does debt work on a grand global scale, where rich countries treat each other differently from the way poor countries who are in debt are treated? That's, well, there's a I start the book with a proverb, American proverb that. Um, 
to go. If you owe the bank $100,000, the bank owns you. If you owe the bank $100 million, you own the bank. Mm. And it's it's like that. If um, you owe the United States $10 million, you're Senegal, and you owe the um, United States $100 million, you're in trouble. Um, if you're Japan and the U.S. owes you $100 billion, you're also in trouble. Um, it really depends on, who, again, who's got the biggest guns. And this is a way that relations of violence, once again, tend to become moralized and, and turned into a way of blaming the victim. But since you know, the direction of the debt and who's got the guns entirely determines how it really works out. Um, one of the interesting things about third world debt, though, is it has largely been paid off. Though. And and it was, people don't realize this, the globalization movement, I like to call it the globalization, not anti-globalization, because we consider ourselves a form of globalization. The globalization movement, or global justice movement, alter globalization movement, there are many names, uh, was quite successful in a lot of ways. In fact, we thought it would take 10 years to turn around the, the, the discourse, that, you know, Washington consensus, um, the way people were talking, anybody who you know, didn't accept this full-blown, total neoliberal, free market will solve all problems rhetoric was, was treated as literally insane. And within two years, you know, this had changed dramatically owing to a worldwide mobilization. I should emphasize that, you know, what happened in the U.S. was a very minor, small element of a, of a global phenomena. Um, really, uh, the people who created PGA, which is the group I, uh, I was with. It was the Zapatistas, first of all, the MST in Brazil, the Karnataka State Farmers Association in India, um, who felt it was really important that sort of Gandhi and civil disobedience should reach places like America and Europe. Um, there were a lot of elements in it. But it very quickly had extraordinary effects. And, and one way that that happened was through what happened in Argentina, um, where there was really an uprising based on those same sort of decentralized, autonomous, what I like to call small a anarchist principles, um, whereby they just said, you know, we're not even going to try to, like, demand anything of the government, the hell of the government, all politicians are corrupt, we're going to do things ourselves, create our own assemblies, um, very much like what's happening now. Um, and the government sort of had to do something to re-legitimize itself. They were in a panic, so they, they defaulted on the debt, which set off this chain of cards, which essentially destroyed the IMF. The IMF has been effectively kicked out of East Asia. The Latin American debt is gone. Um, Chavez played a role in not helping pay it, but they basically prioritized getting rid of it by any means possible. Africa is still in a bit of a mess. Um, but it... You know, it's interesting we're talking about austerity in Europe and America. They're not actually talking about austerity in East Asia or, or Latin America right now. They have other problems. Uh, but the focus has shifted. And in a way, that crisis has kind of come home to the metropolis where you know, the sort of top 1% in those countries are now trying to grab all the cookies as they see their debt empire crumbling around them. Hmm. I'm speaking with David Graeber about his book, Debt, the First 5,000 Years, and also want to talk to you about, of course, the occupation movement that you've been deeply involved in. Mm -hmm. in. In your book, you bring up the question of how we approach who owes what to whom, how we even um, look at these questions, because we're living now at a time when uh, people are more and more aware mm -hmm. of the illegitimacy of the rich debtors versus poor debtors, of the creditors versus the debtors. And um, and, and you know, there's whether we're looking at um, people facing foreclosure because of bad mortgages while big banks are mm -hmm. uh, getting bailed out, or or even um, even other uh, even when we look at unemployment and low wages and people thinking of. Um, themselves as and having this greater awareness of an us versus them, this class divide, which we're seeing played out in the election as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. um, how do you how, how do we grapple with these concepts? Because we have to address that moral, seemingly unbreakable logic of you have to pay back your debts. Mm -hmm. And that in the United States, you point out in your book, is a very deeply encoded logic, much more so than in other countries. So in a way, we're battling against that logic itself. Indeed. And, and the first, well, I mean, I think in 2008, they let the cat out of the bag in ways that they don't want us to remember. But it's going to be difficult for them to do. Um, there's a whole bunch of stories that we 
who told we essentially had to accept that markets are self-sustaining and the only way to organize anything. Well, we realized that wasn't true. They're not self-sustaining. Um, they can only be sustained by constant government support and intervention. Um, the line that you know, essentially capitalism isn't even really trying to justify itself by saying it's a good system in the sense of um, something that will cause generalized prosperity and fairness. They're just saying no other system could work at all. And now we realize that, you know, that line, these people are, might not be very nice, but they're super competent. Well, that's not true. Uh, <laughs> but the major thing we learned is that um, debts don't really have to be repaid. We are moving into a I call it a regime of virtual money. And, you know, everybody talks about this as if it's something new made possible by computers. It's not. Um, as I was pointing out, that's the original form of money. Money has been virtual through much of world history. And we know what that means in historical terms. And this is the way I would... One reason I wrote this book is I think this is a very appropriate time to point this out to people. What we saw in 2008 is the first cataclysm caused by the fact that we have a virtual money system, but we're not treating it in the way uh, we're treating it in antiquated terms, or at least for poor people, you know, as as if money were a thing, a commodity, something there's a scarce resource, you know, there, we just don't have any money, we run out of money. No, we make money. Money is a series of promises. We can make any kind of promises to each other that we want to make. Um, throughout history, in any period where you have credit money uh, is the dominant form, well, people recognize that, so they put safeguards in place to protect people from essentially falling into debt traps because you know, once money is something that's a social construct, you can what's to stop people from just infinitely generating the stuff and enslaving the poor? Um, in the ancient Middle East, they had debt cancellation. You know, either kings would cancel the debts, wipe, wipe the slate clean, or they were jubilees, biblical-style jubilees. Middle Ages, they had usury laws, of both in Islam and Christianity. They eliminated uh, interest-taking entirely and debt peonage, whereas in China they were doing more debt cancellation again back then. Um, and Buddhists also created pawn shops. That's a bit of a long story. <laughs> anyway, right, um, but, um, you know, there's always something in a period of virtual money you can do. Now, the fascinating thing is that this time around, we try to do it the exact opposite way around. Here, they create the IMF to protect creditors against debtors. Sure enough, the entire world is falling into debt traps. We have a design, and people are blaming themselves. So you have to realize that, no, this is an historical phenomenon that's happened over and over again. Um, and, and when I just point out to people, look, most people in history have been debtors. Does that mean most human beings who've ever lived have been vastly inadequate and should be ashamed of themselves? Um, it's the definition of a utopian system that when something goes wrong, it says there's something wrong with the people. Mm -hmm. It's all of them. Um, so that's where I would start. You know, what we, we did it backwards, and we're watching the predictable results. You know, when Aristotle or Hammurabi or Confucius were thinking about the worst thing that could possibly happen, it's basically this. An uh, entire population falls into debt, and you know, if Aristotle were here today, he would find the distinction between being so indebted that you sell yourself to work for others and being so indebted that you rent yourself to work for others to be something of a legal distinction at best. Um, you know, there is a way out, and we're going to have to look at historical examples. I end with a call for Jubilee, partially just to be provocative, but partially to point out that you know this Things like this have happened before, and there are solutions. Right. Well, uh, wh what you bring up in the near the end of your book, which is interesting, is um, you you uh, you quote Niall Ferguson, um, who refers to the industrious poor, yeah. because even defenders of capitalism have to ultimately mm -hmm. justify capitalism as something that will uh, theoretically Lift benefit folks, everybody. Yeah. Uh, but they make a distinction between the industrious mm -hmm. poor mm -hmm. versus the non-industrious poor, people who are just not useful to society, apparently. Exactly, because they spend their time, you know, taking care of each other. Meaning if they're poor, <laughs> they deserve to be poor, which exactly. is what the logic is. Yeah, and, and I, I saw that phrase over and over again. Well, finance systems are ways of moving money from the idle rich to the industrious poor because, you know, there are good poor people and there are bad poor people, and the good poor people are the ones who want to be capitalists, basically. Right. Um, and and I think that debt has... has, has allowed us to create this morality, which is perverse if you think about it, because he, what the last thing we need in this world right now is people to work even more. Uh, people are working way too much. It's destroying the ecosystem. It's, so the, gro the growth levels that are demanded by our current economic system are clearly unsustainable. It strikes me that if there are people out there who are 
taking care of each other and having a reasonable life and, and not, you know, sort of increasing this endless massive expansion that's destroying the world, maybe they should be considered the pioneers of, of, of a new type of economy <laughs> where <laughs> which actually wouldn't destroy the planet. I mean. So let's talk about the Occupy movement okay. and how it has changed the conversation pretty radically just in the last six months. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Um, you've been involved uh, in uh, the, the origins of this movement. I was doing a lot of the early organizing. I mean, me and about 80 other people, I would say, were the sort of people who started putting the thing together in August in New York. Mm. And and how does the Occupy movement's language um, and its framing of Mm -hmm. the current political system uh, address the concept of debt and uh, and and uh, and the con- and capitalism if you mm. will um in in the in the th- that um that fits within the history you've written I about see. well the i mean it's interesting i re- i was in new york in the summer i i was doing a lot of book promotions and i was also doing some of this organizing and i tried to keep them apart because you know you don't want to use a movement to sell your book and you don't want to like impose your vision on, on a movement uh but on the other hand, it was kind of hard to keep them apart because every time I would go to speak to an audience where there's any number of young people about the history of debt, you know, two or three people would come up to me afterwards and say, do you think there's any way we could get some kind of movement going around student loan issues? Yeah. Mm. Um, it was just everyone was just because it just seemed so unjust, the situation that people were in. And when the thing, the occupation actually began in Zuccotti Park, my friend Marissa, um, so videographer Marissa Holmes, was um, was one of the key organizers. Also went around to sort of interviewing everybody she didn't already know who had come there, asking, "You know, why are you here? Tell them, tell me your story." Um, another friend of mine, Chris, put up this. We are the ninety nine percent Tumblr um, page where we got some more stories, and it was remarkably uniform. You now people were saying, "Well, look, I." I, I I'm a, I'm one of the good kids. I did what I was told. I, I worked really hard. I studied hard. I got into college. I got good grades. Now here I am, forty thousand dollars in debt. There's no jobs. Why are there no jobs? Because these guys who didn't play by the rules at all trashed the economy. And now I'm told I am a deadbeat and I'm a bad person because I owe them the money. I mean, who, again, who owes what? To who here? This is ridiculous. Um, and it's that very you know sense of humiliation blowing up in your face again, just as it has throughout world history, you know, being told that you're in the wrong when clearly you're not. Um, and But when you talk about capitalism, it's very interesting. One of the things that fascinated me was the alliance between labor unions and, and working people in general and these people who, you know, are kids who just got out of college and are unemployed. Normally, a bunch of unemployed college graduates worried about their student loan debts are not the sort of people, say, a transit worker in New York is going to most identify with. However, here we have the transit workers union, like, suing the police over the arrest buses and, you know, totally coming down on our side aggressively. Um, and I think it has something to do with a shift in the nature of capitalism itself. Um, which is less and less about, you know, extracting value through the wage at all. It's it's much more about financial manipulation, which through alliance with the state. I mean, it's looking a lot more like classic definitions of feudalism, and, uh, you know, which is sort of directed to political extraction. You know, I... I the way I put it in the new book, I, I say, well, look, you know, you have this famous line from Eisenhower, what's good for General Motors is good for America. You know, what he meant was they were making so much profits, they took 60% of the profits um, in taxes, used it to build roads and highways, which, you know, helped the auto industry. And, you know, that allowed the to redistribute lots of, make lots of jobs, redistribute lots of kickbacks and bribes, and, you know, the economy flowed. Um, now, what do we have? We have... Um, General Motors makes no money at all in cars. It's all in the finance department. Um, all of these, almost all profits are made in finance. These guys are paying no taxes whatsoever. Instead, they take some of the profits from the finance, bribe the politicians to allow them to write the laws to take even more money through finance. So I think the average American, it's hard to get the numbers, is paying like 20% perhaps of their income to the finance industry directly. It's taken out of their pockets. And who suffers the most and who get, can't get out of these things? Well, you know, students are stuck with student loans and the working poor. 
hmm. who are the subprime mortgage victims, who are the payday loan victims. So suddenly they're in a very similar situation. Well, finally, um, I want to ask you about the concept you brought up earlier, which is that markets need government to function, government needs mm-hmm. market. Um, you're a self-described anarchist. Right. How, do, how do we view then what is happening today? Uh, because in so many ways, when uh, the, the left critiques the equivalence of capitalism and democracy, mm-hmm. which, which capitalists like to do, yes. but democracy is considered equivalent to government. Um, and as con- you know, we cannot have, you know, we cannot have our democracy be able to function unless we have a government. So we try to separate mm-hmm. government from the economy uh, in as much as, um, or, or at least have the government have more control of the economy. Um, but how you know? It, how, it, how do you, do you view it? <laughs> well, it's interesting. The word democracy is much debated, and a lot of anarchists actually would totally disagree with me on this one because they say, they say the same thing: democracy is a form of government. Therefore, you have to be against it. Mm-hmm. But if you look at the word democracy, it's it's fascinating. Like well, like any word that everybody has to be for or agrees they like. Everybody has a different definition of it, uh, and no one can agree on what it means. But if you look at the history of the word democracy, um, I've been going through uh, what the founding fathers have to say about democracy. And actually, when I like to annoy people, I, I always point out nowhere in the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence does it say anything about America being a democracy. Uh, those people were strongly against democracy, which they took to mean self-rule by popular assemblies, which started to happen a little bit right before and during the Revolution. There were these big assemblies they called to, you know, call boycotts, and the patriots were involved, and they were horrified by what happened. I was just reading this great account by um, Governor Morris, who's a He's from New Jersey, one of the early patriots. They called this assembly in New York to uh, for a boycott, and suddenly people started debating, debating what the future government would be like. Would it be aristocratic or democratic? And he, this, this is horrible. The mob begins to think and reason. <laughs> you know, what will this mean? Everyone's terrified. Um, you know, they were they were horrified at the idea of of popular democracy, and they created a constitution which they called a republic after Rome, which was nothing if not nothing like a democracy, in order to suppress the danger. Somehow, around the 1830s. And this happened, the same thing happened in France, the same thing happened in England, Canada. Uh, They renamed these republics that were created to suppress democracy as democracies, largely because the franchise widened enough that people who called themselves Democrats kept winning elections, so suddenly everybody was a Democrat before it had been a term of abuse. So the interesting question is why did people like this idea, which had been, you know, everybody had the literate classes, the the ruling classes had hated so. and I've been trying to understand that. I mean, it's still the case today. Most Americans love the idea of democracy. But, you know, is democracy just a matter of choosing politicians to run a government? Most Americans hate politicians and are kind of sketchy on the idea of government. So what is it they're thinking when they're for democracy? It clearly has something to do with the idea of individual freedom and the idea that we should be governing our own affairs, even though it's not clear exactly how. So I think it's quite conducive. Um, a crime thinker, some of my favorite anarchist propagandists put it most succinctly. They said, well, you know, everybody loves democracy, everybody hates the government. Anarchism is just democracy without the government. Hmm. And, and do you think that ultimately this will be the Occupy movement's um, biggest question to struggle with? How do we envision a new system of uh, economy and hence government? I think so. I mean, what we've started with, this is what we wanted to happen during the days of the globalization movement. We thought we'd come up with these models, and they're thought of as anarchist processes, but they come as much or more out of feminism, out of certain spiritual traditions that are sort of cobbled together. They're kind of systems such as decentralized consensus um, that can work without coercion, that could work without a police force. What I always say, an anarchist form of organization is any form of organization that would not require guys with weapons to show up at a certain point and say, everybody shut up and do what you're told. <laughs> <laughs> so any system that w- where you don't need those guys could be an anarchist system. So what we're trying to create are decision-making methods that could work without violent enforcement. Um, and, you know, work has been done this, when we wanted people to learn, because when people find out, they tend to get excited. And it didn't really happen back in 2000, because it kind of got contained in the activist ghettos. You know, activists started all using the system, but other people didn't. And what's happened in Occupy is that, you know, ordinary people are suddenly learning how to do this. It's very exciting. Hmm. Yeah. Well, on that note, David Graeber, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thanks for having me.